so uh, welcome to, what is it? Talking Immigration in Cars with Coffee. Great. Okay, cheers. 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 Welcome, Hiroshi. To you. Yeah, it's great to be here. The coffee. I don't. I, like. I don't drink coffee. Sure. Okay. Well, I'll drink enough for both of us. So. <laughs> the origin of the the campaign and the movement, I guess now that we would call O Four A, really dates from the start of me joining you here. Uh, that's when. I first learned that there was this growing problem that uh, professors who want to hire students as teaching assistants and research assistants couldn't hire those students if they were undocumented uh, because now so many of the undocumented students were, uh, were people who didn't have employment authorization because they didn't have DACA. I know some people look at that and say, uh, you crazy UCLA professors, yeah. you say the law has always required this, um, and you have a good reading of the law. Okay. <laughs> Hopefully, they're, they're, they're honest, they admit, okay. we have probably the best reading of law. Okay. But it's been 40 years that yeah. this law has been on the books, and if this is really what the law always meant, and it's what the law yeah. in fact already is, then why has everyone yeah. in the entire system assumed that this law does apply to states. Why do states use I-9s? Why do universities submit to audits uh, from uh, you know the people who enforce the employment uh, immigration laws if in fact uh, you know none of this has actually been applicable to them from the start? Yeah, no, I mean that's that's you know that's that's a logical, natural, totally understandable. Can I say I feel so appropriate to be turning on Sunset Boulevard and asking right. questions. I feel like this is like that's the right. hardest thing that we're going to do during this week. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Well, <laughs> you know, wish me luck. <laughs> well, I just want to say, you know, for the record, that we're turning right on red. <laughs> um, you know, something that also used to be. <laughs> It took a while to figure, <laughs> figure, figure out that it was actually a good idea. It's actually not only a good idea, but it's also authorized. Um, you know, so I mean, this is this is what happens. There are many parts of LA life that are metaphors for <laughs> for the law and for politics as well. But you know, it's a totally natural question. I think there's a couple parts to the answer. I mean, one is that um, there's been a uh, greater awareness and sensitivity to the power of state governments, and, and that you know the, the federal government shouldn't just sort of be assumed to to run roughshod over over state authority. And so a lot of that law has emerged in the 1980s, 1990s. It gets you know it gets it gets more normalized. Say, shall we say in the last you know 30 years or so? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. You know the law we're talking about is from 1986. Um, at the time, I don't think you know Congress uh, was aware of these issues fully, but the Supreme Court's made it clear, really clear since then, that hey, if the federal government wants to bind the states, it has to say so. It hasn't done so in this case. And so some of this is, is um, you could call it historical, um, sort of historical timing. Um, you know, maybe if Congress had enacted this law in 1996 or 2006, mm -hmm. they might have thought, hey, you know, we need to have a discussion about whether we bind states or not. Mm -hmm. We need to have a discussion about this. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. But because they did it in 86, and it, was, it wasn't on the radar, um, they didn't have that discussion. Mm -hmm. And you might think, you know, well, that's just, you know, well, we, let's assume that it might just bind the states. But the whole point of this is that we can't assume that, uh, you know, what Congress would have done. And then, you know, Congress did go back yeah. as to, after these laws, you know, uh, you know, more, you've looked more into some of these particular laws. And, we're talking about, but basically, Congress did go back and change some of these laws, but in this really conspicuous, I think, meaningful way, they didn't go back and change this. And you might say that's because, well, because they can't just agree on anything about immigration. That you know, obviously, some truth to that. But um, 
But I think the yeah. truth in that is that is that like, we can't assume what they would have decided. I mean, I think that th thinking about it, as I have sometimes from like a litigator's perspective, that change you're talking about, I think, is probably the strongest part of the argument from a narrow kind of technical standpoint. In 1996, so a, a, a ways into this uh, move that you're talking about where the Supreme Court is requiring Congress to say very clearly that it wants to bind the states, uh, they amend uh, the original law uh, to define the term entity. And they say entity includes any branch of the federal government. And they don't say states. You know? And I think that that is really tough for people on the other side of the argument to explain away like, why is Congress doing that uh, if the term already included the states, right? Because if it already included governments, then you wouldn't have needed to clarify that it includes any branch of the federal government. And right. then if they have taken the time to go ahead and specify that it covers governments, why don't they mention states? And the inference to be drawn from that has to be that they uh, did not clearly express an intention to govern the states because they said the federal government right. didn't say the states. So I know this is a kind of like narrow textualist thing that um, uh, you know, modern conservative uh, textualist interpreters are supposed to care about. It's the kind of thing that you see all the right. time in Supreme Court opinions when right. they are uh, uh, you know, doing their very careful statutory analysis. And I'm really, I'm, I'd be very curious to see if, uh, if somebody can come up with a good right. uh, narrow textual right. interpretation for what this could mean other than the inference that, that we've drawn from it, right? Yeah, no, that's, that's, that's absolutely right. And you know, a lot of this is also, you know, I think to some extent, or maybe to a significant extent, a lot of this sounds like, you know, splitting hairs and finding loopholes and, and any other kind of disparaging characterization you might want to um, adopt. But the fact of the matter is, I mean, we actually try to follow the law here. <laughs> The law doesn't apply to state governments, and so why should you know why, why? Why should we act as if it does? It also builds upon you know, earlier state laws that made quite clear that certain areas of state law that um, you know are, are primarily state law. Mm -hmm. Employment's one, education's another. Yeah. You know, um, and there's there's also uh, just the zone of, of state governance here that ought to be respected. That this is not some kind of a benefits program or, or question of you know state generosity uh, to undocumented students. It doesn't mean that jobs are going to be set aside or anything. It just means that they can, if they qualify as the best person, then they can they can apply and get the job. And yeah, I mean, I, I talked to a student who uh, who was admitted to a graduate degree program, a PhD program after having finished their undergraduate degree and done very well um, in the UC and then they applied and got admitted to a, um, a graduate program. Right. And uh, once this, the graduate program figured out that the student didn't have employment authorization, they rescinded the offer. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, and there's this you know, long email chain the student had us showing how they kind of came to realize that they weren't going to be able to teach undergrads because that's what graduate students do in a lot of the programs here. Mm -hmm. And then they rescinded the offer, and I, I, I mm -hmm. felt for that. I felt for that student. That's yeah. rough. That's really rough. Yeah, so obviously, it's a it's a real loss for that student. But it's, you know, it's also a loss that emanates through all kinds of other uh, circles. I mean, it's a loss for uh, the university. It's a loss for the students for whom you know the grad student would be the TA. It's also a loss for the person who will hire. Someone who's been trained, uh, fully trained, you know, by the university. It's a loss to the economy that doesn't get the benefit of that talent. It's a loss to wherever else in the, you know, the, really in the world. I mean, it's 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 not a question of sort of largesse or generosity. It's just giving people a chance. It'd be ironic, um, and frankly, pretty sad if if the governor is. The, is the, is the officer, you know, appointed to really be the spokesperson, the head of government for the state? If if if, if the governor were to decide, well, it's a matter of you know state authority, but I'm not going to 
I'm not going to make the argument with O4A, with the governor's opportunity to, you know, push forward on this, and um, is an opportunity to do something super important for the, the national, even the international narrative mm -hmm. on um, migration policy and how governments ought to respond to migration. Mm -hmm. um, that the border is, is is important, but ultimately, if that's all you you, you care about, you're missing you're really mi missing the big picture, and you're really missing the important picture. This is a chance for for California to say it's really about more than that. It's really more about um, what happens in the state in, for the entire state, mm -hmm. um, and that's just so. It's such an opportunity for the governor to make that statement. I had not even thought about that, but that, that the the governor of California might actually have an opportunity to right. change the narrative around immigration politics through this through this decision. Exactly. It's it really not just it's not about um, the border is a part of it, but it's but it's really um, it's really more about what happens throughout the state. Um, and the other thing uh, that is part of this too is. It's not just about um, what happens now in this precise uh, moment. That too is important, but the, the whole point of a focus on, on away from the border is to say this is really about uh, the next generation. This is really about the generation coming of age and opportunities they're gonna have. We're gonna see benefits of that for the you know, next 50 years.